Are you taking a nap? Morning, everyone. Thank you for getting up semi early um, to see our keynote. We're really lucky we have Dave Kennedy at out. We bugged him and harassed him, and after a while, he said yes. <laughs> now, he's, Dave's a great speaker, and I will let him do his bio because he knows better than I do. So. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, first, can we give a round of applause for everybody that put Nolicon on? What a great environment to come out to, to New Orleans and uh, come out here and have a great time and uh, all that good stuff. So I actually went to bed fairly early yesterday for most of you folks. I think I, I, think I saw most everybody out still at 1 a.m., so I feel pretty refreshed and ready to go. A um, little background myself, uh, Dave Kennedy. I uh, started two companies called Trusted Sec and Binary Defense. Uh, Trusted Sec is a consulting company like that stuff, um, and BDS is a, a MSSP. Um, but you know, my history has always been more so on the technical side of things and, and getting into organizations and more of the offensive. And so I thought today um, I'd talk a little bit about what I do from an offensive perspective, but also talk a lot about how you can detect things that I do um, on a regular basis. And, I'll actually be releasing um, some new stuff on GitHub, uh, probably either today or on Monday, uh, that there's a lot of new techniques that you can do to detect a lot of the stuff that I'm doing. But um, I'm on the news a lot. I've tested in front of Congress. I was a Marine. Um, it's always funny going on the news. Uh, it, I think some of you have probably seen me on there a couple of times, and some of you haven't. But when you go on the news, um, the first time I ever did it, I was terrified. You know, you, you're in front of the screen, and you can't see anything. And literally, you're just sitting there. And uh, you have no idea what you're going to talk about, so you, you study. And I had like a book the first time I was going to go on the news. You know, I had like different points I wanted to cover, and then I had like a five-second you know piece on the news or whatever. And so I started doing more and more of them, and I got more and more confident in what I was doing. And uh, there was a time recently where I was on. And I was supposed to be talking about like you know um, like ISIS capabilities when it comes to I think it was um, on the the dude from Team Poison uh, trick that was you know uh, helping you know the ISIS and all that good stuff. And so I knew my topic very well. And I was on uh, a different news organization, I won't say which one, uh, but they uh, introduced me as an Iranian nuclear expert. <laughs> and I know nothing about Iranian nuclear technology or anything nuclear at all, or even really anything in, that was going on in Iran. I actually don't follow or watch the news at all, which is uh, an interesting piece. So, you know, at that point in time, you know, I went from being extremely comfortable to like, oh shit, I need to figure something out here. And you have, a, you have a choice, like either you like, okay, can I BS my way out of this or can I just tell them that they got the wrong person and they introduced me as the wrong person? And I started to do the BS thing. I'm like, yeah, you know, the Iranian stuff is crazy, but what about those ISIS threats? I was trying to like hint at them, you know, like, hey, you know, probably should be talking about what I was, I was here for. And they started going to like some treaty of like the 1947 treaty of something or another. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. And I started sweating in places that I never knew I could sweat from, like, you know, I'm sweating on my nose, my ears, underneath my eyelids. I didn't you can sweat underneath your eyelids, but apparently it's a thing. Um, so you get crazy situations uh, when you go on those. But I also had another one that uh, asked me how I would disrupt ISIS with an EMP. And I know nothing about EMPs at all. Like, you know, why would I launch an EMP at ISIS? I have no idea. But uh, so you get weird things on, on those. But uh, it's always fun and exciting uh, to go on those type of things. I'm also one of the founders of uh, DerbyCon. So uh, hopefully I'll see you all out there. Sorry about the craziness on ticket sales. That was unexpected. Um, I also wrote the Social Engineer Toolkit and a few other things. So today's talk is on offense and defense. And one of the biggest things that I typically see when going into organizations is the fact that, that they don't understand how we attack uh, from an from a offensive perspective. We go in time and time again, and it's like everything that we do is kind of mystical, and, and it looks like you know, magic from a, in a lot of cases. And folks on the blue team are very attu attuned to the technologies that they leverage, and they leverage those technologies very well. But in a lot of cases, they don't understand the techniques that we leverage to get access into systems. And I'll talk a little bit about that and some, some good stuff around um, the detective capabilities. But this is by far the number one most common thing that I see is, is not understanding um, the thoughts of attacks. If we look at, at actual breaches, based on the, our company data of what we've done for um, incident responses, 82% still endpoint compromise. So you know, going after the end users, 14% uh, is perimeter uh, compromise, and 4% is employee error. So you know, uh, shared credentials or things that they did uh, by mistake. Now, what's interesting about this is that if you look at, at risk, our highest risks in organizations are going to be by compromising the end user, by far. The easiest way, it's a highest return, uh, a high return, low investment um, type of situation. And so we have a lot of security now, um, or a lot of lack of security on the endpoints, and that's uh, one of our major areas of compromise, and I'll talk a little about that. But why we're seeing this is, is the interesting part, and why we're, we're at a point where 
one user can be our entire downfall of our entire organization still um, tends to be the, the case and it has been for, for a long period of time. And so I want to show a little history of InfoSec of why we're at where we're at today. I think it's important to understand you know, where we're at today and why we're there today. And then from there, how do we build and get better at what we're doing? And so if you look at the 90s, uh, which is when I kind of came up, I was programming MUDs and video games and stuff like that uh, when I was a kid. But you look at the recommendations of what we were supposed to do um, then is, you know, you had firewalls, which were a relatively newer concept. And we're like, hey, you have these firewalls, and what you should do is you should do network segmentation. You should, like, segment things off so that people can't communicate with one another. And that was a good concept in the 90s. The 90s were like, hey, you should not, you know, put sales folks on the same thing as IT and IT in the same, you know, uh, you know subnet range as these. You should actually segment off things and, you know, create little containers of your business so that if you get hacked, you know, they don't spread over. But no one really listened to that. And so we have flat networks and all this other stuff kind of happening right today. And it seemed like we were just crying wolf, like, oh, that's not going to happen. You know, we can just build an easy network. It's, it's easier for us to manage a, you know, flat network um, than actually have to go and, and do network segmentation. Well, then PCI happened, right? And everybody's like, oh, hey, well, we have to comply to PCI. There's companies that don't even have to deal with PCI. They're using PCI as their framework, you know, and you, know, you go to a board of directors like, yeah, hey, we have, to, we have to deal with PCI. We have to, you know, do PCI compliance because it tells us to do all these things. You know, and then someone's like, hey, are we even using credit cards? No, but we still need to comply to it, you know, make sure we're doing everything fine. And so PCI was a leverage for us to, to start to build security programs because we were, you know, hey, if you don't do PCI, we're going to get breached. And again, it seemed like we were crying wolf. And then Target happened, and then everybody started, you know, saying, hey, let's not be the next Target, right? How many times did we hear that? How many board of directors did we hear say that type of thing? Um, and then you started seeing Jimmy John's and, home, uh, you know, uh, Home Depot and a lot of the other ones start to happen. And it's like, hey, let's not be the next Target. And all of a sudden, I feel like, again, we were crying wolf about, hey, let's not be the next breach. But then something crazy happened. Something absolutely awesome. The InfoSet market went off the hook. It went crazy. It went, it went, it went like in a completely different direction than any of us could have ever saw. And this was interesting because I remember looking at most organizations like, hey, I can't get you know, funding for staff. I can't get funding for this. I can't do this. You know, I, I can't inject into my business. You know, all this stuff, right? And then you had people that were really freaking out about getting breached. People were terrified that, hey, we're going to be the next person on the news. And then we have these cyber weapons, right, you know, that can completely take apart our entire infrastructure. And we have people that, that look like this hacking in their basements, breaking into organizations and stealing all this stuff. And then we heard terms like advanced persistent threats and sophistication and cyber weapons. And it started to pollute the executives with all these different things. Now, what's interesting today is that if you want to be an APT, all you need to know is, is, is a couple lines of bash. Because you look at what the techniques that they're leveraging to break into these companies, it's not sophisticated, it's not advanced in any way, shape, or form, it's just called hacking. It's what we've been doing for 10 years, or 20 years, or 30 years. You know, and these type of techniques from an advanced perspective, if you look at a lot of the, the techniques that are breaking in today, they're very simplistic in nature. They're not dropping O-days and, and compromising organizations, using very, um, you know, poor concepts. But it's given companies an excuse on how to get out of a breach because they're targeted by an advanced actor or someone that was sophisticated. No, you had horrible security practices for the past 10 years, and you got owned because you haven't passed Adobe Reader in like 10 years, right? That's the reason why you got owned. It has nothing to do with being advanced. You were targeted because you have horrible security practices. But it gave something, um, gave a, an out. But one thing that was interesting about this whole movement is something awesome happened, right? We finally got money. We've been talking about it for 20 years, about how we don't have enough money, how we don't have enough funding, how we don't have enough people. I remember going to talks, and I'd say, well, hey, who here has enough funding and, and people for their, their security program? And, the, and the, the audience would laugh and snicker, right? You still get that sometimes here and there, but most people feel like they've got enough budget. I, I, you know, if you look at a lot of the, the statistics, most security programs are generally anywhere between 8% to 12% of, of the overall IT budget, is kind of the estimate. Now, that's a varying term that can go in a lot of different directions. I was on a phone call um, like two days ago talking to a customer, and I'm like, so what's your general um, you know, percentage? And like, oh, we're, you know, we're 14, or 42% of IT's total spend. I'm like, 42%? Like, how does that even work? What are you spending on? She's like, I don't know. I, we just have cash. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, what, what, what kind of assessments do you need? I mean, you need, I can, I can say, you need a bag? You know, I mean, um, but we got our wish. We now had funding for everything that we needed to do um, and start to build things. And the interesting part about this is we sat there with this big pile of cash and we said, uh, now what? Right? And we sit there and we're like, okay, well, I've been complaining about security for five years in my organization, and now I actually have to do something. 
And now, it ha now I have 10 million risks, and I have to complete everything in a year, right? That's not the directive I got from my organization. I have to do everything in a year. So I need to go hire some people. And so I go to look for talent, but yet this market is so crazy that it's hard to find talent, especially in the locations that you're coming from. And our, our HR departments are used to a regular or, you know, type of, of you know, hiring a normal person and a normal salary. And this industry is blowing up so big that you can't go and get significant talent. So you either have to build from the ground up or you have to outsource. And so you have a shortage of talent in this industry, which can continue to happen. But what's interesting is we've got this big effing pile of cash just sitting there. And we don't know what to do with it. Like, I got a million dollars sitting right there. It's in cash. And I don't know what to do with it. And so you saw a, a lack of, of, tech, of, ta of talent and a significant need to address things very quickly. And that's when we started to see the technology era and the product era. And so you had this whole industry that consumed this industry around technology saying, hey, if you buy my tool, it's going to be so much better for you to stop the advanced persistent threats and the sophistication and all this stuff. When you have, you know, Tomcat, Tomcat on your effing web server on the outside. APTs are the least of your friggin' concern, right? Let me tell you, the last time that I've used a zero day or an, even an exploit on a company has been years. I haven't needed to use an actual exploit to compromise an organization in years. Is anybody here a pen tester or a red teamer? So put your hand down if you had to use an exploit to compromise an endpoint in the past couple of months. You had to use an ex exploit? That's pretty good. Oh, I was confusing with that. Sorry about that. It's still early in the morning. So has, has anybody had to use an exploit recently to compromise an endpoint? No, right? It's not, an, it's not a, a zero day that's going to compromise you. And so you get all this technology, and you get stuff that protects against zero days. And you get all this crap that you know, makes your, your computer run significantly slower. And you, they can barely even use the damn computer, right? They're like, hey, I have to give a blood sample and a pee sample to make sure that I can get in my computer. I am who I, am who I say I am. And then all of a sudden, it takes you 16 minutes to log into your computer because you have to do two-factor authentication on your phone, but your phone doesn't work, so you got to go call the IT guy, and then it's, you know, it's a six-hour process just to get to your computer. Don't even talk about VPNing, VPNing in. I had a customer where they gave me a, a VPN token. It took me two days of the engagement to get access to the VPN. Two days. So now we have all this technology to try to protect us against APTs and sophistication when we have the most horrible security program that isn't built from a foundation. If you look at this, the worldwide cybersecurity market was valued at $77 billion in 2015. It's estimated to grow to $170 billion by 2020. This is from Forbes. Many of the companies have doubled their investments recently in purchasing of technology. And so it seems like every single day, there's a brand new piece of technology that's coming out that's going to save your ass when it comes to sophistication. And so you see all of these different tools and all these different technologies, and there's investors everywhere. I don't know if you know about this market, but if you have an idea, you can get a million dollars for an idea. Hey, I have an idea that's going to revolutionize uh, security. It's called turning off a computer and, and not letting it run, and people won't be able to get hacked. That's a million dollar idea, right? So investors are, are throwing cash at this industry, attempting to, to get something that sticks because it's booming so large, and they see the value in this because there's not a lot out there. And what's interesting is that there's serious, what we call Series A through B through C funding. And I don't know if you know about um, uh, like investments and, and getting funding and all that stuff, but if you've gone through what we call Series C, which a lot of the companies that you see now breaking down your doors have done, it means that they haven't been profitable their first round. They haven't been profitable the second round. They're on a third round to try to get profitable. And so they're blowing money on marketing and a bunch of other crap because their technology isn't working. And so they're trying to get profitable and get into these doors and get companies to buy them. But they're the next revolutionary thing that's going to stop you. It's got artificial intelligence that stops 99% of the hackers. Seriously? That's crazy. I want to show you a, uh, a video we made really quick. One second. I won't show you the whole thing. But we, uh, we also created a, a technology that will stop all the hackers. I'm about to put this up here because it doesn't have sound, so give me a second. Let's see, where's that? Where is it? Our videos are literally just messing around. Where did they go? Oh, here it is.
Well, this isn't loaded. I won't worry about it. Who's slowing down the internet? Seriously? Probably is Adrian. There it goes. Here at Trusted Zach, we have created the number one product out there that you must have right now. We call it the Hacker Vaccine. This technology has been in development for the past two weeks. It's something that we've developed that we know will completely change the industry for the better. Something that not only guarantees 100% full coverage of stopping all the hackers from the tracks. We didn't think 99% was good enough, so we went full 100% coverage on all hacking uh, attempts. And we'll completely shut down the hackers right at their footsteps. We're so excited here that we are having a release party here next week just to be able to celebrate the release of this new piece of technology that we, we believe is revolutionary um, and it's going to change the whole market for this. So people ask, how does the hacker vaccine work? How can you stop 100% of the attackers out there? That's a good question. You know, when we were sitting there trying to figure out exactly how to stop hackers from the tracks, we knew that the only way possible was to develop sophisticated artificial intelligence that goes through your entire network and it completely shuts down all of the computers in your environment so that people can't use their computers for hackers to break into it. This revolutionary concept, which is now patent pending, completely shut down all of your environments, all of your users, so they can never, no longer work, download those pesky viruses, and there you go. There's the problem. It's, on. it's now fixed. I used to be afraid that my computer would be hacked into, but I no longer need to worry because it's turned off. Thanks, trusted sec. version, version 1.0.1, we're going to be releasing a new module called the Enforcer. What's great about the Enforcer is not only does it track the attackers where they came from, we use sophisticated techniques called ping in order to locate exactly where the hackers are coming from, and then we deploy antigens in order to actually go and stop the hackers with what they're doing. This is a long random pause of Paul. <laughs> it's enforcing time. Our enforcer module literally sets somebody to somebody's house, beats them up, and makes sure, make sure that they don't ever hack you again. This is our guarantee 100% that they will never touch your computer system, regardless of where they're at. They're not no! <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> I am the enforcer. <laughs> That's what this technology is today, guys. Anyways, so there's this big focus on technology over talent. And, and that's really caused this industry to go in a, a cataclysmic effect because, you know, you have someone that's been working on ASAs for 10 years. Let's say you have a network engineering department that has five people. And those five people know ASAs inside and out, right? But you have a pile of cash and you need to go and buy Palo Altos. Because Palo Altos are next gen, you need next gen technology, right? Because next gen's what we have, next generation has got to be better, right? And so you have. 10 years of horrible network design, flat networks and everything else. And like, hey, but we got this awesome next-gen technology, so we're going to use the Cisco importer tool and import all of our shit into this Palo Alto, and now we're next-gen. How's that supposed to change anything? I don't understand. Like, now you're next-gen because it, it gives you a little bit of analysis on the protocols? Like, I don't... So you, now you've introduced a bunch of new technology that's complex, complex in nature. You have all the folks that were Cisco folks. Now they're trying to you know, figure out Palo Altos. I'm not saying Palo Altos are bad. It's a, it's a great firewall, right? But the complexity itself they introduce causes much more of an effect than actually building the security programs. So let's take a look at how endpoint compromises work, and I'll show you uh, one of the new uh, releases I'm working on in set uh, that should be out in the next few days. Um, but if you look at how I actively go after an organization, uh, first I do my homework, right? Looking at uh, open source intelligence, you know, things like that. Then I develop an attack, and then I actually go and attack. Now what's interesting about this, this technique is you can literally go after anybody that you want to within an organization, 
And most of the tests that we do, though, in companies, like, hey, I need to do a sample size. You know, I have a 20,000 employee you know, organization. I need to do a sample size, so I want you guys to send phishes up to 5,000 you know, people at once. That's not an accurate test of your security program. As an attacker, what I typically do is I, I research one or two people, and I build my attack off of those one or two people. And then I send an email, or I call somebody up on the phone with those one or two people, and that's it. And I wait. If that doesn't work, I move on to another you know, one or two people. You know, and so it, it keeps me completely underneath the radar to where I don't have to worry about a lot of the different things here. One of my favorite ones that I always remember uh, doing is uh, going after a company that was celebrating, I'll just say 50 years. It wasn't 50 years of, of, of business, but they're an American company, and they're so happy about being 50 years in business and the manufacturing space and all this other stuff. And so I went to the website, and you can see it's like all over their site, you know, 50 years of being an, an awesome company and blah, 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 and they're really happy about it. You go to the press releases, and it's all press releases about it and everything and how they love their employees and all this other stuff, and you know, they're having an event and all this other stuff. And so I sent an email to um, the uh, um, person that was in charge of the press releases because there's a little contact us button on there. And she sent me an email almost immediately. And what's great about that one email is not the, the headers or the IP address that's coming from or what they're using from an exchange infrastructure or a technical perspective, but how they format their emails. Now I know, you know, hey, they use this font and this disclaimer and you know, this, you know, this type of lettering and all this other stuff, so now I know how to format my emails when I'm sending them in. Then I sent an email out and I said, hey, you know, based on uh, you know, 50 years of, of, of being in business, we're going to send out you know, 50 free iPhones to the employees that, that go through this, this raffle or whatever. And so I sent it out to the, to the um, employee staff. I only sent it out to two people. I had over 100 shells on, my, on, the, on the system because people were forwarding it to other people like, hey, did you see this? And they're like, no, I didn't get that. Why didn't I get this? And they forwarded it to another person. I had 100 shells. You know, in my environment, I'm like, what do I do with these many shells? It's pretty awesome. You know, this is great. Um, you know, and what's interesting about that technique is, you know, it, you, you entice people, but it's super simple and ridiculously, you know, stupid, but it's built off of their company. No one expects you to build an attack off of their company. That was also kind of funny at that time um, is I couldn't escalate my permissions to administrative level, uh, level rights. And so around 4 o'clock, people started going home, and I started losing shells. And I still didn't have a maintained foothold into the environment, so I'm like, oh, crap, you know, I don't have a lot of time. And so I spoofed my phone number coming from this person's desk. I had, you know, um, OWA and the global address list. And so I spoofed my phone number to the help desk, and I said, hey, um, you know, I, I'm having an issue. I'm getting a in, – in IT people are so predictable because they get annoyed with people that don't understand technology at, uh, at all. So I started, like, talking and things I had no idea I was talking about. Like, yeah, I'm seeing an NSVRT DLL kernel zero, and I read the whole thing. It was, like, really long. And uh, he's like, well, can you try going to, um, you know, um, see if you have internet and go to, like, Internet Explorer or something. I'm like, I don't know what that is. Is, is, that, is that on my desktop? And they're like, uh, yeah, hang on. Which, hang on a sec. Do you know your IP address? I'm like, what's the IP address? I don't understand what you're talking about. I'm like, you know, can you just help me out a little bit? And you can tell the person's getting annoyed. And uh, so they remote into this person's computer. And I get a Kerberos token, and boom, you know, elevated access into the environment, which is great. So, um, you know, those are techniques that you can leverage in a lot of cases if you're in a, in a pinch. But that's typically how I do my homework. Now, one of my favorite ones that I, I recently did, and this is a, a segment on CNN, is um, people, when they go after help desks, typically, like, you know, try to reset passwords or something like that, right? And that's kind of okay, but in most cases, that's pretty lame because you need to know a lot of information about somebody. It takes a lot of time. And I'm a lazy person, right? I don't want to sit there and spend a whole bunch of time figuring out the last four of somebody's social security number or an employee ID or things like that. So what you can do in a lot of cases, and this has been effective for me time and time again, is spoof your phone number coming from, you know, your uh, internal company um, thing to, to, to deflate anything. But you don't have to. You can just call from any cell phone that you want. So you can be in a, you can call from like a different, you know, country. They don't look at that and care. But um, what you do is you ask them, you know, to go to a website and they'll go to it without verifying a lot of the employee things. And that's what I did here um, uh, on CNN. I just want to show you a, cl a quick clip of it. It's pretty cool. I disagree with this whole comment, by the way, but it's not up there. ...than anyone you'll ever meet. David Kennedy is one of them. He's what's known as a social engineer, or a people hacker. His craft is to dupe you into doing things and sharing information you probably shouldn't. Can I just get your, your, your credit card number? Some use it for illegal activity. In David's case, companies pay him to find out if employees are leaving the company vulnerable. He and his team show us how it's done. Step one, spoof his number so it looks like he's calling from inside the company, and then call tech support. Hello, you there? Hello? Hi, it's Ken. I'm I was wondering if uh, you could uh, take a look at a website I'm trying to get to. It's for... Now, this one specifically, um, we got a customer to allow us to go and do it as long as we didn't use their name in any way, shape, or form. 
So it's funny, the first time I called, they answered with their, their, um, their company name. So I was like, click, and I tried to call again, and then I got somebody else, which was cool. So this is like my, actually my second attempt that I did it. But, um, so we got permission to go and do this. So this is a live company um, and all the good stuff. A big, uh, big customer thing I'm working on for Monday, and uh, I can't seem to get to the website from my computer. Sure, uh, what's the website? I'll see if I can get to it. Thanks, man. I really appreciate the help. I mean, it could be a stupid thing. I'm, I'm, I'm really stuck with computers, but uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's www. Survey. That's uh, S U R V E Y dash pro dot com. Yeah, I got a prompt to open. I uh, just put open, and I'm at the site now. Here's what the IT guy doesn't realize: by clicking that link, he's just given David full access to his computer. Whoa, okay, that's weird. I just hit it, and it works. Seems like it's working fine now. Awesome. Well, I don't know what you did, man, but I really appreciate the help. Hey, no problem. That was it. We're on this computer right now. You were able to take take over this this guy's computer within, I would say, like, under two minutes. And the funny thing is, I didn't do any research, I didn't do any reconnaissance, I just I just found their help desk number by calling the main line and then called a couple places, and that was it. It was like, you know, a couple minutes of just, you know, work and getting into their infrastructure. Um, and I'll show you how I did that attack here using the HTA attack vector. And it's funny because this method, um, HTAs, are nothing new. Like, I, there's this old book, it's from like 1998 or something like that, it's like a rainbow book, and it's like really fat and thick. It's like, and it looks like, you know, like a horrible computer book, right? It's got these rainbows and stuff on it. And like page like 1000 or something like that, it's like, hey, there's this way you can use HTA files to completely hack into a computer. And that was like 1997. It's still completely valuable, you know, valuable today. It still works great today. So um, this method I, I definitely use a, uh, quite a bit, and I'll show you this in just a second. But it's funny because, you know, people are um, very predictable in a lot of ways. They want to be helpful in a lot of situations. And there's a lot of different techniques you can use in social engineering. A good example of that is I was doing a, um, a thing for uh, um, um, a news organization, and the, the anchor wanted me to hack into her boss, okay? And I'm like, okay, well, that's fine, whatever. Um, and so I look up the person's name, and, um, you know, and I won't say which news organization it was for, um, but, you know, I look up the person's name, and the person happened to be in Paris uh, filming a thing for this, this news organization. And just by his Twitter feed, I can see all of that. And so I call, you know, I spook my phone number, and I, um, call, I come from a 1-800 number. I didn't care which 1-800 number it was. Um, but I also looked up um, who the credit card providers were. A lot of times you'll see, like, press releases and things where, like, you know, a big company will say, oh, hey, we partnered with Chase, or we partnered with so-and-so for our corporate, car or corporate credit cards. And then I happened to find a, a press article from, like, you know, 2010 that said, hey, we partnered with, uh, you know, let's just say Chase as an example. And so I, I spooked the uh, calling number from a 1-800 number and called, let's just call him Bob. And I said, hey, Bob, this is so-and-so from Chase Fraud Services. Hey, I, we're noticing some, some strange activities. Um, most recently, it looks like uh, in, in Paris. Are you, are you currently in Paris right now? And what I was doing there is, I was, I was, one is I'm making myself believable, right, saying I'm from a, a fraud services company. I know which company he has from a credit card perspective. And I know that he's traveling to, to France. So I built a little bit of rapport all in a couple of seconds to establish myself. And you can hear that, that Bob is in a, um, you know, a location that's kind of public, you know, and he's kind of like agitated a little bit. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Paris. Everything's fine. Okay, no problem. Um, I'm like, okay, well, can I, I have to go over a couple of, of these um, um, uh, charges uh, from you really quick, if you don't mind? And you can tell Bob's starting to get a little annoyed, and 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 that's kind of a dangerous situation for us social engineers because they normally will just click, you know, and hang up on you. They have those the, those type of opportunities. So I had to do something quick that was going to put them off center, so that I can at least get control of the situation and I can dictate the the things that happen next. And so I said, okay, Bob, you know, did you spend, you know. Uh, 1,272 dollars at GermanDungeonPorn.com, <laughs> and Bob's like, uh, no, uh, no, 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 that's not me. That's not me. I'm like, okay, okay. Um, did you spend, you know, and I, I named up some horrible stuff like animals, and you know, it was terrible, right? <laughs> and Bob is completely embarrassed. He's in a public location, and Bob is uh, is at this point in time taking these things very seriously, right? He's very scared about what's going on. And so I say, okay, Bob, no problem. You know, I, I just need to ver verify these and I'll get them uh, knocked off. And when are you coming back from, from France? We'll monitor your activity and only allow charges coming from France and all this other stuff. He's like, oh, thank you so much. This is horrible. I don't know how this happened. And, and Bob, you know, it happens a lot of times when you're traveling overseas. But what I need you to do is I need you to repeat the names that I just said to you and the values so that I can remove them off your account. So, you know, he's in the corner like, yes, it's, 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 you know, like he's really nervous at this point, right? I'm like, all right, Bob, I need you to verify your full, your, your full credit card number um, so I can remove these charges. Give me his full credit card number. I get his social security number. And I start asking for things like his wife's social security number. He's like, why would you need my wife's social security number? But, it, but it's, you know, 72394, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, all right, Bob, that's, that's cool, buddy. Thanks. So, you know, you can do what you need to based off of targeting your individuals and, and creating a fantasy that, that seems believable in every way, shape, or form. So this is using um, uh, the, the HTA attack. Uh, vector, and this is one of my favorites uh, in set. Now, this new version that I've been working on 
Uh, it's pretty cool because it's um, what a lot of uh, like virus companies are doing and things like that is they're they're looking for um, specific methods of like PowerShell injection now. So PowerShell, you know, by far is is one of the easiest ways to compromise an organization and not have to leave trace remnants of what's going on. But you know, with like things like PowerShell Empire, for example, getting a lot of popularity and a lot of the talks and researchers going after PowerShell and you know invoke Mimi cats and all of these things that we leverage as pen testers, but also the attackers do the same type of thing. Um, people are starting to get pretty savvy at, at PowerShell injection. And so um, the methods that I, I released in this new version don't actually call PowerShell in any way, shape, or form. So it actually does PowerShell injection without call, calling PowerShell. So it'll obfuscate all of that so that it's not actually calling PowerShell.exe. So you don't get picked up by things like, you know, um, something that might be looking for like dash encoded command. It was funny because the last version that I released um, of set was getting picked up by Symantec. And I'm like, that's weird. They're picking up PowerShell? Okay, well, whatever. So I look at it. And I start going through it, and they and I had a hard-coded variable name in one of my uh, uh, encoded command parameters, and so I changed the variable name to be randomized, and it completely got through Symantec. I'm like, so you literally wrote a signature for my tool with because of one parameter, and that's how you did it. Seriously, that's how bad those are. But anyway, so it randomizes all that now. It's not a big deal, and doesn't even call PowerShell anymore, which is even better. Um, so we'll go and launch the SE Toolkit. And so um, I'm going to go to the uh, social engineering attacks, which is number one. And can everybody see that okay? I can blow it up a little bit more. Is that better? Uh, we'll go to the website attack vectors, which is number two. And we're going to go to the HDA attack vector, which is number eight. Now, again, you know, um, the la I, you know it's interesting. I'll ask folks like pen testers and things like that, like, hey, when's the last time that you um, use an exporter? What do you use to get access to an organization? A lot of times it's still Java applets are still very, very predominant of getting access. Uh, embedded Excel um, macros are still very applicable and, and usable. Um, you know, so there's still a lot of methods, but this one, you know, it might seem kind of hokey, but it works every time for us. It was funny because Martin was doing a pen test, uh, pure hate, Martin Boss. Um, and he was doing a pen test, and we were laughing at him because he was using this HTA attack vector. And, Emily, and Justin Elzey was, was, you know, uh, Justin and Martin were like, all oh, this HTA vector stuff is going to work, and we're making fun of him. I'm like, ah, yeah, it's not going to work. It's cute with your little HTAs and everything. And they went and launched it, and we got like almost like 90, it was like a 94% success rate on everything that we hit, right? And I think the two people that we didn't get were because they were out of town. So, you know, I was like, seriously, that really worked that way? And you're like, yeah, it works great. Okay, so then I start, started switching to HDAs is kind of my main method. Um, so I see my IP address real quick. So I'm going to go to the uh, site cloner, and I'm just going to clone like whatever, trustsec.com. And then I'm going to enter my IP address. And then I'll just do 443. I'll just use a traditional Meterpid reverse HTTPS. Now I do a little bit of uh, funky configurations uh, when I build this so that the standard Meterpreter shell doesn't get picked up. Um, like for example, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but when um, you download the reverse HTTPS uh, stager, it actually downloads a PE file. So it's actually uh, downloading a, an executable. So when your first stage triggers and goes to the internet, it actually goes and downloads an MZ header. It has an MZ header on it. So it's downloading a, a, an actual executable from the internet. Most content filtering stuff will typically block that, right? So what you can do is if you set enable stage encoding to true, it randomizes that um, using Shikata, uh, which is an old encoder, but it, over the wire, it doesn't get picked up by anything. And so it's actually like raw blob of data that's going back. So that gets past um, a lot of that stuff. And then also um, some of the defaults in there, like the SSL certificate stuff, there's a couple static pieces in there. So I patch those um, so that doesn't get uh, triggered or flagged when it goes through. And so it'll generate everything for us. And uh, for the actual PowerShell command too, um, the, what happens in this specific attack is, is when, it, um, injects in, uh, when it injects the code, it uses a technique that uh, Matthew Graber uh, originally created, which is, uh, Matthew Graber is like one of the best PowerShell folks ever, by the way. If you um, check him out, one of the best PowerShell folks you've ever, ever meet in your life. Got a huge man crush on him. Um, but uh, he came up with a technique that allows you to inject shell code directly into memory uh, through PowerShell, which is really awesome. And it's under the PowerShell process. Uh, what I did is, is, you know, what you'd have to do is you'd have to determine whether or not it was 64, 32 bit, and then use a specific command for each one. And when using set, I don't want to have to spray a 64 bit on a 32 bit or a 32 bit on a 64 bit and cause issues. And so what I did is I came up with a new attack vector. It's called the x86 downgrade, which um, looks for the operating system that it's in, and then it downgrades that process to a 32-bit process regardless and spawns that PowerShell process um, from a 32-bit perspective. Um, so you, it basically will sh shoot native 32-bit shellcode on a 64-bit platform, or if it's 32-bit, it just uses 32-bit. Um, so it doesn't cause it to crash or anything, which is nice. And that's all into, into this. And I will go... 
So the steps that a user has to take to actually do this HTA attack are interesting because they actually have to click run. I hate Windows so much. And like I'm running this with like nine gigs of RAM, and it's the slowest thing I've ever dealt with in my entire life. So you have to hit open, okay? So that's one thing that a user has to do, which you know might seem like it's kind of crazy. And then, why didn't it work? Ah, it's funny when you're doing coding changes in the middle of the night. Why is it not open? That's weird. Oh, there it goes. I guess get a shell. Never mind. All right. Well. Okay, great. Just hit, hit open, and as soon as you hit open, um, it gets you access into this. Now, what's interesting is that different browsers have varying things. Like uh, Chrome and Firefox will actually show that it's signed by Microsoft Corporation. And do you want Microsoft Corporation to actually go and run? I'm like, yeah, yeah of course I'd want that to run. It's from Microsoft. That's got to be good. Um, but you can build that into your pretext. Like, hey, you need to open this up to verify something. One of the key ones that I do is like employee uh, employee benefits, and we have to verify that it's your computer. So click open when you actually go and do it. Um, and then you get access to the computer and all that good stuff through that. So just hit open to verify. There's also another technique in here, and I don't have a lot of time to go through it, but I'll show you real fast. It's called clickjacking. I'm not clickjacking. Uh, hang on a second. Webjacking. So you go to social engineering attacks, website attack vector, and it's the webjacking method, number five. So I'll select that real quick. And then I'll just clone, uh, like, G uh, I'm trying to think. Gmail would probably work. Yeah, thanks. I wrote the tool and I messed it up. That's cool. That's what you know. Now, why I like this one specifically is because it takes advantage of everything that we know about education awareness. So what I would do is build this pretext up in a way that you know has a nice and pretty uh, page, a nice pretty website, and I would say you know hey make sure you hi you hover over the link and make sure that it's going to you know uh, benefits.trustedsec.com. Obviously find a third party website that that does this. Now notice here when I highlight over this, can you see the um, let me see there? Can you see the bottom left hand side? It's a little small, but it says um, accounts.google.com, right? There's no trickery there. It says HTTPS colon forward forward slash accounts.google.com. That's legit, right? So if I click that, it should be perfectly fine, right? All right. If you click it, I notice I actually go to accounts.google.com, but it does a quick redirect to our malicious website. And now we've taken control of that, right? So you make a believable site. I'd obviously I'd register like a domain name and things like that. But it redirects and you can capture whatever you want. So you can launch whatever attack vector you want to go after, all those, those, good, stuff, uh, those good things. So another easy way of, of getting access. So that's um, some easy ways of getting in, right? And that's typically what we use. My main method of exploitation, um, or main, main methods of exploitation still to this day are executables. By far, PE files are the, the main method, dropping executables on a machine. Ransomware still uses executables. The fact that you know, everybody's freaking out about ransomware is a, an indication that we have poor security practices of stopping executables in our environments. Uh, what was interesting is I had a, a large financial institution call me up on the phone and say, hey, Dave, um, can, we, can, can you help us out with our business continuity and disaster recovery program? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. Like, yeah, we're trying to figure out how to address uh, ransomware. I'm like, sure, I can, I'd be happy to give you some good ideas on backup strategies and all this other stuff. And they're like, no, we want to use you and buy Bitcoin from you so that in the event that we have an issue, we can just pay the ransom and not be interrupted. <laughs> and I'm like, are you, are you serious? Really? OK. All right. Anyways. Um, everything is slowly moving to PowerShell. Uh, now there's going to be Bash in Windows, which I thought was amazing. That's going to be great. Awesome. Uh, can't wait for that. Now what's interesting about this is that the argument is, is that it just takes one, and, you know, and this is the, 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 what we always use as a red team uh, um, technique, right? Hey, I can always break in because it just takes me one flaw to get in your environment. But you have to stop a thousand different um, vulnerabilities, right? And that's always been the argument. What's interesting is uh, Jeremiah, and, and who I respect a lot, and Egypt that I respect a lot from, from Metasploit, Jeremiah said, it said an adversary just needs to find one vulnerability to win. To do that, they just need to find one system that the target doesn't know they own. And that's a great example. But what Egypt said, to a counterpoint, 
Once you're on a system, adversary rules reverse. Blue only needs to find one indicator of compromise to catch them. And that's so true. As an attacker, yes, I only need one flaw to get into your infrastructure. But it only takes me one mess up that you have a detective capability on to actually go and catch me. But we're not building those detection capabilities into our environments to look for those. And that's the big difference. Yeah, you might have a thousand or a million risks, but if you have great detection and you stop it on day one versus day 20, that's a lot better of a situation that you are in than, than before. Some of the things that I love are honey tokens. Um, that totally jacks me up as a pen tester. I highly recommend incorporating this in your environment, and it does, it's, not, it's not impactful at all. It's very easy to implement. You can do it in like a day. Um, and what honey tokens are is you create a, um, a specific command. I'll show you the code, and I'm going to release it next, next, uh, next week. And this is the actual code here. Um, but what happens is it creates, it's, you can use it as like a scheduled task on your environment, then have it run once a day. And it creates a process in suspend mode, and it creates that process using fake credentials. And I recommend creating a domain admin account, a, a legit domain admin account that you don't use, give it like a 500 character password or something like that, right? And, and lock it up in a safe and never use it. And what you do is you create this account and make it look like a good password, right? Like, you know, hey, this is a super awesome domain admin one password, right? And what I do as an attacker is with this, this honey token in the scheduled task is it shoots these into memory. And when I compromise a machine, I'm looking for those tokens. If I find a domain admin token, I'm going after that token in two seconds to find that. So if you have that in there, I'm like, oh, there's a domain admin token. I'm going to check real quick to make sure it's a legit account. You know, hey, oh, it's a legit account? Okay, I'm going to go and use that. And as soon as you use it, you look for the login, uh, login failure, um, which is 4625, failed logon for that specific account. And that is a, hey, I need to respond immediately because someone is in my environment from a machine that I need to specifically attack. And that event log contains the remote address as well. It's, it's logon type 3, remote logon ty uh, ty type 3, and it's going to have the host name and the username that they used. It's exactly what you need to be able to detect that. That's a great benefit. There's also something you can do that is one of my favorites. It's uh, everybody use Responder, LLMNR, and, and, and NBNS attacks, right? Responder is like cheating, okay? It's like you literally put it on and then you get creds and then you own the network and they're like, oh, you did some magic and you got creds. It's crazy. And no one ever fixes it, which is great. Um, but what's great about this one is uh, Ben and I were doing a, a course out in uh, South Dakota and um, they have, uh, um, we figured out a way, and it, the, the code's up there, so it's at github.com. And I'll, again, I'll post all this on. If you go to github.com slash binary defense, I'm going to put all this up here on Monday, so you'll see it there. Um, but Ben wrote some uh, uh, PowerShell scripts that you can uh, leverage as well that sends out fake MBNS and, and LLMNR um, uh, queries. And there's two ways that you can do this. One is put a domain, put that same domain admin username and password in there, right? Because you can specify a password. So put that same one in there and wait for a failed login attempt, OK? The second thing you can do is um, it, it's actually a way of detecting responder in your environment. Uh, when you actually send out that PowerShell command that he wrote, what will happen is it'll, it'll sweep the network. And if anybody responds, responder has to actually catch it and say, yep, I'm that, I'm that host name. You can send me your data. Okay? What happens is if you see an um, event log 4648, explicit creds were used in order to log into an, in a remote system with that specific account, you know that responder is on your network. Because no one should ever be accepting those credentials on your network and, and, and communicating with it and saying that they're that host name. So there's actually a proactive method instead of just waiting for them to crack the password and get access into your environment. So you can actually look for those specific ones that actually find that on your network, which is really awesome. So I'll be, I'll be um, releasing that source code. PowerShell, um, with PowerShell version 5, there's some amazing uh, detection capabilities you can put into it, specifically with uh, uh, if you enable script, blo um, script log uh, block logging, uh, you can get the actual PowerShell command itself. So you can actually pull in PowerShell commands and all that good stuff. You can actually stop PowerShell, too. If you have good uh, access controls in your environment, um, if you have people that um, uh, are, are not local admins, you can see an app locker, which you have as part of group policy, disallow PowerShell.exe and a few of the other ones uh, for, for anybody other than local admins. And it can literally stop PowerShell from running in your entire environment. So there's so many different ways you can mess with us um, as attackers. But those are just a couple. Understanding red makes you better. Those techniques really mess me up as an attacker. And it's the same tax that, that other people are using, too. It's the same that your sophisticated actors in China and Russia and Iran and North Korea with their crazy cyber weapons are destroying companies with, right? You know, they're using the same type of techniques that we leverage on a regular basis. The truth of the matter is, is that 10 years of neglect isn't fixed with one year of investment. It takes time to build all these up, and it takes time to build all of your programs in to understand that. And so understanding that being, uh, being blue is also about being red now. You have to have that mindset of being purple. You have to understand both of them. Part of your job isn't just to understand a piece of technology. It's about understanding that. And we face a lot of issues um, around sustainability. 
If you look at, uh, there was an e, uh, ENY uh, study that came out that said, um, what threats um, or challenges are your, of, of your greatest concern? And the two top ones by far are sophisticated attacks uh, um, targeting at your organization. The second one was phishing, social network exploits, or other forms of social engineering. What do we actually spend our time on? Uh, security vulnerabilities introduced through the purchase of off-the-shelf software. Internal mistakes or external attacks that cause my organization to lose compliance. Security vulnerabilities introduced in my own application development. Accidental data leaks by end users who fail to follow security policy. And then from that is phishing, social networking exploits, and all that other stuff. So our, our jobs today are dealing with fires on a regular basis versus actually proactively going out and looking for these things. It's the term what we call hunt teaming, right? We hear a lot of that, which is a very solid practice about going out. And so we can't be a mystery to one another of how we do things. You know, our focus needs to shift to understand a lot of the different things that we're doing from a um, security perspective. And look at complexity. Complexity is definitely one of the largest issues that we face as well. Um, introducing complexity into our environments, new pieces of technology. Just know that if you buy a piece of technology, you have to have two or three people that support that technology, right? You can't just be like, well, I'm going to divert him from the new Palo Altos we just got so that he can do DLP now. Or she, he or she, it doesn't work that way. You can't just like, hey, I'm just going to leave that and tuck it away. They can uh, require that. Users, I go into organizations, they have all these awesome programs. Like, well, hey, how do you, what do you do for um, detect, detection of your endpoints? Oh, well, we, don't, we, don't do any, any, we don't do any event logs in our endpoints or anything like that. I'm like, if you don't do any event logs in your endpoints, you don't have any visibility into your infrastructure. Event logs can literally find most of the stuff that's out there. There's so much information on that. There's what are called WMI intrinsic and extrinsic events. Um, you can query those for some amazing pieces of information. And I'll actually have a couple of samples that you can pull from like privilege escalation, a couple of other ones I'll be releasing on Monday as well. Um, but you can leverage those to query and look for specific indicators. I use that on IR all the time. Like I have scripts that go up PowerShell and just query WMI and, and pull all the data back that I need and look for, for IOCs that I'm looking for. It's fantastic. So in order for a business to operate, um, a balance between security controls and awareness is, is critical. Um, and, and I would spend a lot of time on this just this specific topic, but the culture that you instill from security has to be one that's healthy and it has to be one that's positive. If you guys are the draconian folks in your organization stopping everything, that's bad. If you look at it again, your two highest likelihood areas are, are going to be user population and your perimeter. Penetration testing uh, is an interesting topic because, you know, normally it's one of those things where it's like, hey, you have a pen test done annually. And you take those results and you kind of fix them and you might do a little bit with the, the defenses around it. But what we're finding is that you need to have a team, either internal or external or whatever, that focuses longer term working with your blue team. I was just on a purple team exercise where our objective was a pen test, for lack of a better term, but that wasn't the focus. The focus was building the defensive capabilities inside of the organization. And uh, they had uh, the company we were working with, a massive organization across the world, um, they were leveraging uh, uh, Carbon Black. And, and what, we don't care what tool you're leveraging for your detection, whatever you decide to buy is fine. But we came out of that with like 72 different watch lists for how they can detect. We got PowerShell injection licked, we got privilege escalation licked, we got lateral movement licked. You know, all those things that we'd want to do. And that exercise was just a weak engagement. Can you imagine if that was spanned over a month, or two months, or three months, or four months? You have to have those exercises in your environment because your detection becomes something that is so much better than anything else that's out there. The tool that you buy that has the default use cases isn't going to have it in there. I was going to talk a little bit about bug bounties, but I don't have the time for that, unfortunately. Um, but cool stuff will be releasing next week. Honey tokens, suspicious file detection, uh, miscellaneous scripts on detection. I'll, po I'll post a link of Ben's uh, LLMNR and MBNS spoofer out there that really jacks us up as pen testers. Um, that's our GitHub page uh, right there. So it's github.com slash binary defense. And you can also do github.com slash trustedsec. That's got all the offensive tools um, that I write all the time. There's also a couple of ones out there like auxiliary. Uh, if anybody has ever deployed OSEC, um, HIDs, it's a complete nightmare to manage because you have to um, develop key pairs. So I wrote an entire protocol um, that automatic, automates the installation and provisioning of all the keys so you can deploy it out via an MSI and just install it across your entire organization. Um, that's up on there as well. Um, some mitigations that I really like. Um, compromising machine, the randomizer disabling of local admin accounts. Um, that is one. You know, I shouldn't be able to move laterally to other systems, so disabling your local admin account and only using you know, um, privileged accounts that you can, can actively go and do that. Um, so lower user privileged accounts. Um, domain admins should never be logging into member servers, period, ever. Why do you have domain admins logging into member servers? It makes no sense. Keep your domain admins only logged into domain controllers and make another account for member servers. Remove that so that I can't get to the access to the thing that I want access to. Um, remove excessive account usages. Uh, vulnerability management is still key. I still break into people using stuff from like 2005. I mean, still MS 0.67. I don't understand how it's possible. We are failing so bad if we have MS 0.67 in our environments. It's terrible. Um, stop basic binaries. 
you know, uh, uh, application whitelisting actually does a decent job at certain things. I'm a big fan of application whitelisting if you can deploy it. It's not perfect in any sense. Doesn't stop against PowerShell and stuff like that, but it does a decent job. Um, you can disable PowerShell execution. Endpoint visibility is huge. Um, this this GPO right here jacks me up completely. This one is the worst GPO that that you can put in your environment for me as an attacker. Um, if you can configure this to deny access to this computer from the local network and remove the local administrators group from that, it totally f's me up because I can't do things like PS exec or you know um, you know WMI injection stuff like that. I can't do that type of stuff with this specific group policy enabled. So you put this in and you say the only group that can remote in is 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 not local admins, but you know it, it create a specific group that says hey you know, these these folks are admins or whatever in the domain. That really messes me up. So last but not least, uh, we all need to be purple. I learned so much working with the blue team about how they defend against things, and it also makes me a better hacker as well, right? It's like, hey, I do this. I'm like, oh, cool, I can do this now. Um, but we work together to figure out each other, to understand each other, because it's no longer, hey, I'm on the red team, I'm on the blue team. It's, hey, we're on the purple team working together to figure things out, and that's what we have to do. There's a good book I recommend reading. It has nothing to do with security at all. It's called Originals, and it's a guy, a uh, professor out of Wharton, and uh, he wrote this book about how nonconformists kind of change the world and, and how people that don't attest to a certain rationale of thinking can go in and change an industry for the better. And I highly believe that we have those people in this industry today. You know, we're told, hey, you know, a pen test, we need to do a pen test annually. Build your own pen test team. You know, do your own stuff internally. It's great, fantastic. It's going to put me out of a job, and I'm fine with that. I, I can go start to be a CSO somewhere or something, right? I don't know. I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably get out of security. But, um, you know, do something that, that makes a difference in your organization you're dealing with or the industry as a whole. It's very easy to complain to say that we're horrible as an industry, and it's very easy to complain to say that everything's messed up. It takes a completely different person to actually go and change it. And so if you look at this book, it's people like, you know, Steve Jobs, who, you know, had his own um, uh, laundry list of failures, right? And how he overcame those and what he was able to do. And other folks that have done, you know, things that just changed and disrupted a complete industry to make it better. You can do the same. Anybody have any questions? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks.